Welcome to the Sustainable Dish Podcast. I'm Diana Rogers, a real food registered dietitian, author, and sustainability advocate. I co-host this podcast with James Connolly, who was a producer on my film, Sacred Cow. I also founded the Global Food Justice Alliance, an initiative advocating for the inclusion of animal source foods like meat, dairy, and eggs for a more nutritious, sustainable, and equitable worldwide food system. You can check it out and join me at globalfoodjustice.org. Thanks again for listening, and now on to our show. Hey everyone, Diana here, and as you might know, I've been traveling a ton and doing a lot of speaking for the Global Food Justice Alliance. So for today, I'm releasing a show I recorded for another expert, which I thought you'd enjoy. To join my mission at Global Food Justice, please visit sustainabledish.com backslash join, and you'll get access to early ad-free podcasts, the full video versions, exclusive downloads, and a community discussion group. So head over to sustainabledish.com backslash join and support the work I'm doing to push back against the anti-meat narrative. Thanks so much and enjoy the show. Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. I'm so psyched today with me. I have Dr. Pran Yoganathan. Is that is that close enough? I'm sorry. I, I think maybe I even said it more accurately before we got on the air. Is nah, that... Nah, that, that's, that's fine, Donna. You, very close. That's cool. All right. Well, so I met him on Instagram and uh, am a huge fan of his Instagram feed. It's um, pretty cool to see another um, medical professional, especially a doctor, a GI doctor, talking about crazy things like diet. Um, so I'm so psyched to have you straight from Australia. And um, I love everyone's origin story. That's I always love to kind of go into that first. So why did you become a doctor and specifically a GI doctor? And then how did you get into this whole sort of crazy alternative way of thinking that, you know, maybe we shouldn't be eating so many processed foods. Sure. Th thank you for having me on, um, on your, on your podcast, Diana. And, um, it's a, it's a pleasure to finally catch up with you. Um, uh, I, I can give you a little bit about, uh, myself. I am, um, originally from Sri Lanka, uh, which is a country in the Southeast of Asia. Um, I left that country very early on in the peace and we, my father um, took us through Africa and we lived in a couple of countries in Africa and then ended up in New Zealand and I did all my uh, medical training and high school years uh, in New Zealand actually, um, I'm located now in Sydney, Australia where I've worked for the last 20 years. Uh, but going through medical school, I, I was fairly early on in medical school. I, I think I was in, I was about 16 uh, when, when I entered it. So I, I entered it very, uh, probably very immature. Um, uh, you know, I'd been sort of pushed into medicine rather than an actual passion. My true passion was mathematics. And I'm a very objective, uh, pragmatic type of thinker. I think a mathematical mind kind of leads to that type of um, analysis generally um, and a lot about medicine um, when I when I was going through medical school didn't kind of make sense to me it was I, I was always uneasy um, with 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 it I think really clicked for me in third year when third year of med school when we started doing clinical work which is that that we were allowed to go into the hospital and meet with patients um, it started making sense to me then, um, and, and I think I started enjoying it more because you saw the, um, the actual practical side of, 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 of healthcare rather than just the theory. Uh, but I can tell you, as a, as a doctor going through that six, uh, six and a half years of training, very little um, attention was paid to that nutritional aspect of it. And, and we were told, I mean, we were told very quickly on that almost all modern illnesses are created by the modern lifestyle, yet there was just very little focus on, on the lifestyle. They talked about the importance of non-sedentary behaviours, yet we weren't taught how to action that and what, what constituted non-sedentary behaviours. We weren't really taught diet. And, 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 and to me, the diet that was really pushed was obviously the food pyramid, I think, which we're all um, uh, familiar with uh, the USDA food pyramid, which um, is, is um, 
America's sort of global export and uh, it's been assumed um, everywhere. And um, it, it, the, the food pyramid to me didn't really sync up to what, what humans have kind of eaten for, for millions of years um, because I had a very, um, a very big passion for kind of understanding our history and I spent a lot of time studying papers on that even though it wasn't really relevant to my medical degree at the time um, so coming out as a, as a junior doctor um, I mean you see a lot of illness it's um, it really is quite overwhelming uh, as, a, as a young doctor you see a lot of chronic illnesses and as you progress through the ranks you see a lot of futility of care um, as well where all these enormous resources are, are thrown at people that uh, some of them sadly don't even know who they are because they've got dementing illnesses. And, and um, I just saw a lot of, um, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't describe it as cruelty, but I, but I felt um, a lot of patients were going through uh, things that they may not necessarily would have wanted to go through, um, driven a lot by hospital protocol, doctor's preferences and family's guilt, uh, I think, that, that they were, you know, sort of passing on. Um, so... Given that, I, I about five years ago, when I was about 35 years old, um, when I started sort of suffering probably early metabolic syndrome, uh, Southeast Asians are sadly predisposed to diabetes and, and we tend to develop metabolic syndrome at a very um, low body fat percentage. Uh, my father, who's a diabetic, um, type 2 diabetic, and, and all his brothers that had died of coronary artery disease before the age of uh, 60, um, most of them were gone with metabolic syndrome. Um, I, I decided I, I kind of didn't want that for myself. So I fell into a bit of a rabbit hole, um, sort of like Alice falling into that, that, um, that, that hole and, and, and just discovered a different way and, uh, of doing things. And, and not all of it has been led by traditional healthcare models like I've um, you know followed people like yourself uh, and and many others in this space um, uh, who kind of opened my eyes I think initially I went down that low carb uh, lifestyle and uh, then eventually more down that whole foods pathway which is where I am now and the lesson that I've kind of learned from all of this is really that that food is almost everything in 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 terms of generating health and exercise follows that very, very closely, which seems to be a radical way of thinking in the healthcare industry, which blows my mind. I think you said it best when, when you put it up, I think it was a post uh, that you've done, I think you quoted someone when you, when you said you got the healthcare industry that doesn't care about food and I'm paraphrasing here, but, and, and the food industry that doesn't care about health, I think that's perfectly said. Yes. Oh my goodness. I took so many notes and I relate so much to so many things you said. Um, and I mean, I got into this with undiagnosed celiac and metabolic syndrome. Um, mm -hmm. and so why, I mean, particularly for GI doctors, I find it fascinating that so many of them are still, I have a, a good friend who was at a major hospital here in Boston. We have some of the best hospitals in the world. She was in one of the best and her, um, she had ulcerative colitis and the doctor said, well, you can change your diet if you want, but it's really just, we're going to have to do a resection to a woman who at the time was about 30. Hmm. Um, and you know, it's very rare that I find a GI doctor. I mean, maybe ones who deal with celiac. I did a rotation at the um, Celiac Center for Research. And, you know, we were talking about gluten-free diets and things like that. Um, but it's very rare to find a GI doctor that actually believes that n n food, I'm almost laughing because it's just so ridiculous that, that food, I mean, especially for GI, right? Yeah. Why? Why is it so radical? Um, I, I think it's important to kind of look at that. And I've spoken on this before. A lot of my posts are extremely political and probably mm -hmm. polarizing. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is um, I'm just saying it. I'm saying the truth from my perspective. I, I guess it, it polarizes people. But, but 
you know, I've got to be honest to myself. And, 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 and the reality is, Diana, we, we've got, and, you know, we, we've heard of Eisenhower's uh, military industrial complex, right, which he warned uh, when he was the outgoing president uh, there on, on that. We've got the food pharma medical complex. It's, it's, it's this, you know, it's this triangle, which, which sadly, I think um, we've, we've been it, it's been infiltrated and i think disease is so profitable um and 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 really we're kind of indoctrinated as doctors from a very early stage that it is we've got to practice evidence-based medicine and evidence-based medicine largely is keeping on top of these new medications that they keep bringing out and it's almost impossible to do it because there's there's hundreds if not thousands of of, of papers every year that are being generated on newer therapies and now we're in this realm of biologics and so mm. forth and and, and and the way it's made to look is that disease is inevitable at every stage of life for human beings but this is not the case you just have to look at the way these hunter gatherers and 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 you know just more ancient civilizations that live the way they they humans have always lived to see that that these people don't get that disease and, you know, 50 years ago, even in the developing nations, you could have looked at the developing nations and mm -hmm. said, well, look at this, that they don't develop the disease. That's until, of course, the, the as, as I said before, America kind of exported its, its, its diet globally. And now we've got this global pandemic of illness. Um, but it's really interesting. I mean, you, you, you mentioned this at medical meetings and, and straight away the response from a lot of my colleagues as well, they die young, you know. That these people die young, um, which, as we know, is is partially correct. I mean, um, you know, infection is very prevalent in in, in these sort of um, and infant mortality, right? That's right, infant mortality, um, and even in the developing nations, that's the way. You know, like a lot of them die of just drinking contaminated water, mm -hmm. um, but that's uh, again a function of kind of their civilization poisoning them. It has nothing to do with chronic illness. When I'm talking about chronic illness, I'm largely talking about obesity, type two diabetes, hypertension, ischemic heart disease or heart disease, strokes, gout. I mean, the list goes on really, Alzheimer's dementia. So we become accustomed as uh, in the medical industry to, 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 to assuming that, well, disease is inevitable, that that is uh, going to occur regardless. And we need drugs to combat that. But but really very little attention is being paid to the preventative model um, of healthcare, which I think is where the true answer lies um, uh, for a lot of people. Right. And I mean, so you were talking about how America's exporting our, our horrible way of eating to the rest of the world. And it really is true. And a lot of people have also sort of um, implied that it's like colonialism through you know, junk food, really. And you'll even see people who will, you know, it might be cheaper for them to eat their traditional food, but you've made it if you can afford American junk food. And so that's like a status symbol in, in some countries that I've been to. And if you can control a culture's food, then you can control the the people right so it, i mean this gets political really fast it does and and you know listen i, I love americans i love i love the culture <laughs> I, love, I love country music my my family's uh, my wife's family um are american we might be coming to america um later on uh, in the year uh, it's nothing to do with the country per se it's everything to do with this horrible model of corporatism of food really the, the corporatization of the food supply in america um really kind of um, i mean it had its advantages so uh, it's, no one can doubt that right like you know corporatization allows for that efficiency but then when you've got these companies like nestle and 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 um and uh you know mcdonald's and and and, and, and so forth the list goes on kfc and and, and everything, it's more that hyper palatability aspect of it that these guys have really mastered the marketing, obviously, to uh, to every age group and, and, and the hyper palatability aspect of it and um, out on the diet. And I think when you've got a global population that's kind of protein starved 
fundamentally it's this insatiable hunger that they've, that they've got and what have they got surrounding them, America's um, uh, export basically. Um, and, and that's a sad fact. So I know exactly what you're talking about, but some people may not. I talk about this in my book. Rob talks about this a lot in Wired to Eat, but can you, just for the folks that aren't familiar with this idea, uh, because a lot of people have never maybe heard of it, or there's a lot of people out there denying it, right? Walter Willett at Harvard, you know, Mr. Dietary US Guidelines. We don't have a problem with protein in the US. We don't, you know, so... So can you talk a little bit about our, our protein need and what happens when we're feeding that with junk, hyperpalatable junk? Sure. I think there's this concept out there with, that we need to eat to, to fuel ourselves fundamentally. Okay, that, that's step one. Now, fuel, I, th I think most of us don't realize we're carrying kilograms of fuel on us in terms of body fat, okay? So people think that they're eating to fuel themselves. Really, we should be eating to constitute turnover. And, um, and that's what it comes down to. I mean, you can eat to fuel if you've got the activity to support it. You know, we know of, you know, guys like Michael Phelps, who was knocking back, I think, something like ridiculous 15,000 to 20,000 calories when he was uh, when he was competing. You know, the guy ate all day, basically fuel that activity and still managed not to have uh, have, a, have a very athletic body and a low body fat percentage. It, it, it fundamentally comes down to activity. So if we can assume or we can we can pretty much say that most people in the world now have very low levels of activity, um, because you know we've got cars and public transport and 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 and, and so forth and, and humans by nature I think are a very lazy species we're built to conserve energy in a low energy environment um, historically but now we exist in this high energy environment we are drawn to sedentary behaviors whether we're lazy um, so essentially where where you've got this situation where people's protein intake is extremely low. And I disagree with Walter Willard. I mean, if you assume that 35% of your daily intake should come from protein, you know, you've got America sitting at, I think it's something like 10 to 12% um, is where their dietary protein is. And, and I think a lot of that actually comes from plant protein, um, which as we know is, is, I mean, it goes in, but is it is it absorbed and broken down and assimilated into our bodies as quickly? I don't think so. I think um, plant protein is far less anabolic in its um, in its uh, ability and its ability to incorporate into muscle protein in particular. I mean, we know that will... because of the amino acid. You know, there's very specific amino acids that are much higher in meat that are. And when you say anabolic, for the folks who don't, let, that means you know, uh, being able to build new muscle. Correct. And, and we've got to acknowledge that as a species, our muscle quality has really declined in the last, you know, um, you know, a few decades. And, and really, people, people don't realize that there is an epidemic of muscle loss. There really is. And, um, and so uh, th th this is the issue. We've come to, um, come to believe that, that our protein, into, like you look at America, they thought of it as a big meat-eating country, you know, and, but they're really not when you break down the figures. They're, they're protein starved and they're surrounded by these foods that are rich in, in carbohydrates and fats, you know, your, your, your uh, milkshakes, your fries and, 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 and burger patties and so forth. But what is interesting to, to me is what may constitute a McDonald's meal um, or something similar with milkshake, fries, burgers and the patty. The patty only makes up probably 10 to 12 percent of, of the actual calorie intake there yet that meal would be labeled a meat-based meal and a lot of our nutritional research obviously focuses in on those those aspects of it um, so this is why a lot of the issues arise from that type of nutritional epidemiology that is used to then make these broad statements that you know meat's causing all this disease it's it's flawed from the start so uh, the point that I'm trying to make, uh, fundamentally, if you, if you look at it, is it's, I'm trying to um, acknowledge something called the protein leverage hypothesis, which is that when an, when an animal, in particular mammals, 
uh, keep their protein intake low. They are driven to find protein that they've got this hunger. Um, but we are, we are replacing that protein with fats and carbohydrates, which are both energy sources. And so we're just storing this energy. We're unable to build new muscle um, because of the low protein intake. We're losing muscle and bone, yet putting on energy. So, you know, obesity is often thought of as overnutrition. In fact, it's, it's, it's a state of malnutrition. Um, so really, we've got global malnutrition on a grand scale. So you can get malnutrition with low energy, like we see in a lot of these developing nations with these very thin, starved children. These are, these are people that have malnourishment in the setting of energy um, uh, scarcity. And then you've got what we see in the developed nations and, and some developing nations where you've got protein starvation and energy excess basically which is which is what a big city is yes and so when i go around talking about why why we're not eating too much meat why um you know so in america it's about two ounces per person per day of red meat intake that is not too much and this whole idea that um you know we're eating too much meat we all need to eat less meat it's you know, I, it's easy for me to make the case in um, like the work I do th through Global Food Justice Alliance in low and middle income countries where people um, may not have the access to all the plant-based foods to make a vegan diet. Um, and, you know, perhaps grazing animals might do best in their area. People get it, right? Of course, don't take meat away from them, but we need to eat less meat, right? And I try to point out that, increasing animal source protein will help not only with malnourishment from low calories, but also the obesity epidemic we have here because we still have iron deficiency. We have um, B12 deficiencies and we have this overconsumption of calories um, driven not only from seeking protein, but also then these foods are hyper palatable. So we're just like, you know, we can't stop eating them. Um, and you know, one of the major issues I have with the Meatless Mondays uh, campaign and also now this new Vegan Fridays in New York City public schools, most of these kids are low income in New York City. And when you look at like the uh, meal that you illustrated, the burger, the fries, all that kind of stuff, when you think of what a typical American child eats, it's chicken nuggets, mac and cheese, pizza, and burgers. And so when we tell these kids that meat is bad, they're not replacing it with kale salads and chickpeas. They're replacing it with what? Just more fries. Uh, I'll go and get a, a, a Subway sandwich and just don't put the meat on it, right? So we're actually doing a massive, massive disservice and people don't understand how absolutely elitist it is to be telling these poor kids that meat is the problem when anyway, I find it just so incredibly frustrating where this rabbit hole that we've gone down. Um, and I'm sure you're seeing it in Australia too. Absolutely. And listen, uh, th there are people um, that can thrive on a plant-based diet. I think it's a low mm -hmm. percentage of the population. Humans are amazing. Like, you know, the genetic pool is amazing. We're, we're always kind of prepared for a, a disaster that requires us to be flexible, right? Like, you know, that, that's how evolution works. That there's no doubt there are some people that can, can pull it off on a plant-based diet. However, it is often with the requirement for supplementation, that's number one. And number two, a hell of a lot of preparation required for that, right? And, and what we know about the economics of health or healthcare-based economics, the lower someone is on their socioeconomic rung, um, less that food is a priority to these people. Survival is a priority. Avoiding domestic violence is a priority. You know, just, just putting a roof over their head is a priority. So absolutely it is elitist to, to expect these people to, to know, number one, what a good plant-based source of protein is, such as soy or chickpeas. And then number two, have the preparation to, to do that. And with plant-based food, I'll be the first to say, that is, it is very difficult to make it palatable, <laughs> right? So, you, you know, uh, uh, it is, it, that's a fact. I mean, it's, well, especially it's when you're competing with these, um, 
the, these beautiful fat and, and salt combos that you get with pizza and mac and cheese. Yeah. hundred percent. That's exactly yeah. right. So you can do it if ideology drives your behavior and you're an animal activist or whatever it is or climate change, you can, you can push yourself through it. But naturally, if you take a human in their natural state outside of the ideologies of Civilization, a hunter gatherer, for example, that there's no doubt what they would what they would choose if, if you're given the option, uh, but then give them the option of hyper palatability, and eventually you'll hook them onto that, you know, mm-hmm. because that that's what hyper palatability is. It's a drug. So you get these yep. this situation, you know, where most of you'd have to acknowledge most of America probably lives right on that border of that poverty line. Um, and you're expecting these people to pull off a plant-based diet, that, that's impossible because food is not a priority to them. And uh, in a lot of these suburbs where these people exist, they are surrounded by the predatory food environment that I've uh, described. You could walk into a petrol um, store and, 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 and purchase a meal in there, but it's all hyperpalatable energy. It's very low protein meals. And, and uh, I think this is the situation that we've got, we do have the global elite uh, that seem to be pushing this agenda and um, and what their end purpose is, uh, I'm not too sure because uh, I think it is going to destroy a lot of a lot of health. Uh, I think we'll see the pharmaceutical industry flourish, of course, but um, you know, economically, you just wonder how viable all of this is. Yeah, um, I learned that lesson when I, what, what you were just talking about, I just want to drive that home a little bit because um, as a dietetic student, I was working in a low-income area of Boston. I was helping in a store that was selling health food in a um, pretty bad neighborhood, very bad neighborhood. And they were selling made meals with like steamed rice and collard greens and jerk chicken, like culturally appropriate meals for this community um, at a very low price, cheaper than the fast food. And they didn't know why people were coming, weren't coming in. They, they like mm. we did had no customers, right? Mm. And so I went around to these health clinics and asked, why aren't people coming in here? Here, everyone talks about food deserts and access, and here we are with all this access why aren't they coming in? What, what can we do better? And they um, quickly put me in my place and told me, okay, if you have a hard life and you're worried about not getting shot and your car starting tomorrow and not losing your job, at the end of a really stressful day, do you want steamed chicken and kale or do you want something that's going to taste good? Like that might be the cheapest way to instant pleasure that that some people have in their whole day that you know they might be looking forward to and so getting a relatively inexpensive fast food meal where the kids aren't going to argue where you know it's going to taste good um you know on the maslow's hierarchy of needs yes. it's a privilege to worry about long-term you know health and not getting type 2 diabetes and all these things it's it, you can only worry about those things if, if everything else is taken care of right if you're not worried about meeting your mortgage and you know all these other things that just so many people are worried about because humans only have the capacity to worry about so many things right you can't worry Absolutely. about every single issue there is Absolutely. And, and I've made this point before, again, you know, I, um, uh, I, I sort of, I, I get into the economics of it to really improve people's health. You've got to kind of pull them out of poverty, but more people sink into poverty. And on top of that, if the messaging, the subliminal, well, it's not subliminal, it's overt messaging that mm-hmm. meets bad. I mean, meets destroying both your health and the environment. Um, and by the way, you're well, a bad person if you eat it because you're killing beautiful animals. That, that's right. That's exactly <laughs> right. So if you've got that sort of messaging, I think you've got a you've got a perfect storm there where where people um, it's it, it really fundamentally drives them only one way, um, and um, and that's down the hyper palatable pathway. Um, so y- y- you'll find that that a lot of people that are plant based in higher socioeconomic um, uh, statuses or where they've got more disposable income, they tend to do a lot better than someone trying to do it on a low income. It is uh, it is impossible to pull off. 
Right. And, and we've also seen skewed research. There was that paper that came out funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, that showed plant-based uh, pregnant women in India do better, <laughs> better pregnancy outcomes, right? And nobody is, is, is even pointing out the fact that it's socioeconomic. This has nothing to do with the fact that it's meat or not meat. Exactly right. Exactly right. I think India, just to touch on that example, since you brought it up, I mean, if you look at a nation that is uh, very low on animal source protein, India is a great example. They've got a few billion people. They're, they're ideologically, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the majority religion there is, is Hinduism. And I'm, I'm born a Hindu, even though I'm not practicing. Um, the, the whole concept behind that is that the, 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 they're basically the cow is a sacred animal. You can't can't consume it. Historically, it was not the case that the, the, the origins of Hinduism, the cow was sacred because they treasured its flesh and its milk and, and so forth, but it's been subverted over these few hundred, if not thousand years to, to mean that it cannot be um, eaten. Um, India is a great example of a country starved of animal source protein. Now, India's metabolic health is is an absolute mess. They may, may not have the obesity rates that the Americans do because, as I pointed out before, sub subcontinental Asians tend to develop diabetes at a lower body fat percentage. So a lot of these people with huge numbers of diabetes, I mean, you could take a city in India where 35% of them would be diabetic above the age of 18, right? We're talking big, big cities. Um, and another 35% on top of that are pre-diabetic right, pre-diabetic, um, not defined by fasting insulin level. Now, if you were to do fasting insulins on, on most of these people over 18, they, you would find that probably the majority of the population, 90% probably have elevated fasting insulin. So, um, because as you know, for pre-diabetes uh, criteria, uh, fasting insulin is not necessarily criteria to diagnose it, but if it, it, it's a great marker of evolving type two diabetes. So you've really got a situation that, that kind of proves uh, on a very large scale that, that plant-based eating really hasn't worked in uh, India. And uh, it was a perfect storm for them because um, they had, they, I think it, it's fair to acknowledge that they had massive nutritional issues. And then the Western diet got introduced to them. Um, and that's when things really amplified in terms of their poor health outcomes. I think something like 60 to 75 percent of um, of Indians are iron deficient, and that's including children. Um, I think it's a huge proportion. So it, it, it is very elitist of uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to publish that sort of research because it really doesn't uh, take into account the actual practicality of the issue. Right, um, and it's so funny because when I talk about metabolic issues um, with a vegetarian diet and a lack of protein. Uh, people here will cite, well, but everyone's healthy in India. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, wow. There is a, this romanticism that um, I think that, you know, people who are Hindu or Buddhist are, are he healthy and more spiritual and, and better people. Um, that started in, in England um, with Pythagoras actually um, coming back and uh, went vegetarian and thought that that's what would make him pure, right? Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, it's fascinating to, to look at all of that. And also what I try to point out is you can only have a vegetarian society if you have Muslims to eat the meat from the dairy. Like some, you have... You can't have all this dairy, which is highly consumed in India, if you don't mm. have another group of people who are willing to eat the um, the male cows that are the byproduct of the dairy industry. Yeah, exactly. It's a great point. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, one of the issues that we have also in America, I think, is this immediate gratification culture and this consumerism and materialism. And so I, I want what I want and I want it right now. Um, and Amazon prime, you know, is, is only forcing that if you can't get it in, in, you know, waiting a week 
for something to be delivered is way too long, right? You want it mm -hmm. within the next two days. Um, so I think that that also kind of fuels this expectation that I deserve any flavor that I want right now because, because I deserve it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the, it, um, the current culture kind of builds that egocentric uh, model where the kind of the world revolves around the individual and, and, and instant gratification is part of that culture, but you can't kind of blame them because, you know, they, they're conditioned for this, um, right. for everything from, from Instagram for likes to, to Facebook, they're conditioned for instant gratification and food is just one part one facet of that instant gratification um, uh, aspect of, 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 of modern society. Um, and it, 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 that comes at a price, I think, uh, Diana. One, I think it's, it's the physical health. And secondly, the mental health uh, and, and, that, and the resilience that goes with it. We, we're seeing an epidemic of that in our, in our younger age group where they've got anxieties and, 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 and depression and, and you know, just to name a few psychiatric conditions, but we're not, we're not built for this, um, th this sort of um, environment. Really, one has to almost uh, acknowledge that, that modern civilization is fundamentally poisoning us, not just the food environment, but just this, this corporatism that, that's evolved. And, and you know, I, I admire America. It was built on capitalism. It was free markets. And, and I think that that's what makes... America is such a superpower and, and, and look at what they've done. I mean, they've been responsible for so many developments in, 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 in human culture, but at the same time that, that capitalism unfortunately evolves into this accumulation of power, which is, which is a corporatism. The corporates then start running the show. And once the corporates start running the show, you've got a real issue because they've got unlimited money to throw at advertising at research on how to hook people and, and this is what's um, this is what's happened. So to to almost get your health back, it's almost important to unplug from that environment and 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 seek a different different way of doing it. Yeah, I I don't know if you've ever read the Brazilian um, food guy food uh, policy where they tell people um, to be highly critical of marketing from corporations to cook more at home to teach other people how to cook. Uh, it's it's pretty pretty cool. Yeah, um, I mean that sounds brilliant. That sounds brilliant, and I, I'm unaware of sort of Brazilian uh, or Brazil statistics in in terms of health. Oh uh, well, I don't know that it's made great strides uh, in translation to the public because the last time I checked, I think they were number one or in the top three of sugar consumption in the world. Um, so, and they, you know, as you know, they have a lot of poverty um, there yeah. as well. Uh, but the document is really great. <laughs> oh, that, that's brilliant. And I, I agree. I think we've got to bring that back. I think we've got to uh, reintroduce ourselves to the kitchen. Uh, people spend less time in the kitchen, I think, and, and, and really pass that culture on to our, our children, that joy that's, that comes from cooking a meal or even just making a simple omelette, um, you, you know, which a lot of kids have lost, lost sight of all of that. You know, for, for them, a meal is finish school and, and, and walk through McDonald's and pick up, pick up a meal, then that's become normal and normalized. Uh, I think that's a real pity. And actually a new, um, a new, um, like, what do I want to say? Trend. I don't know. I was I'm losing that word is snacking culture. And we know that yeah. like you take the same amount of calories and condense it into two meals a day or maybe three meals a day has a very different effect than grazing all day. But that's what you're seeing now, especially with, um, I have two teenagers and they're just, they eat whenever they want. Mm. And it's just, that's, that's what we're seeing now. And it's setting people up for a much worse um, metabolic condition. Absolutely. I mean, as human beings, just on a basic physiological level, like uh, I don't think we're meant to graze. I think you look at grazing animals um, that, that we see in the wild, whether ruminant or non-ruminant, and, and really what they're trying to do is they're trying to extract meaningful nutrients, including amino acids, mm -hmm. out of food that's not all that meaningful or, or nutrient-rich, which is basically grass and talking about plant food there. So 
you've got to eat for large proportions of the day to be able to extract the nutrients. You've got to have the gastrointestinal tract that's designed for such nutrient poor food in terms of the ability to process. That's very market and ruminants where they have this, you know, four chambered stomach. But human beings, we've got, we've got an extremely simple digestive tract. And that's what I've come to appreciate as a gastroenterologist, that, that really there's nothing spectacular about our gastrointestinal tract. It's extremely simple because a lot of the, lot of the foods that we were consuming over our three and a half, four million year history, you know, as, as, a, as a human, was extremely nutrient dense. It was so nutrient dense that we, we, we probably spent... 2% of our day eating uh, versus what we do now, which is spend the majority of it, you know, sort of grazing away because what we're consuming is nutrient poor as opposed to eating nutrient dense meals where you'll find automatically, you, you know, put emotional eating aside. If you, if you were to consume nutrient dense foods through the course of the day, the, the eating frequency really drops off. And a lot of people find that when they eat a lot of animal pr protein, they, they might drop their meals down to, 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 to twice a day uh, with no snacks in between, um, you know. And uh, but, but again, it's the messaging around that animal protein is bad. I think these people are driven, driven, to, driven to graze, but we're not grazing animals. Yeah, and it's so liberating when you're not constantly thinking about food all the time or feeling hungry all the time. I think a lot of the mood swings and anger and tra your traffic rage that you see out there is really just people who don't have stabilized blood sugar and aren't, you know, really fully satiated and happy because they're getting, um, you know, full bellies full of nutrient dense food. And I feel so yeah. much better when when I've eaten, you know larger meals of, uh, of, you know, pretty good servings of meat. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without a doubt. It, um, you know, we're really built for that feast and, 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 and famine, um, type of makeup. And it's very difficult to, to spend 4 million years evolving into this, into this beast. And then have have that pulled that rug pulled out from under us in the last 30 to 40 years with with these changing and eating guidelines i still don't quite understand what an eating guideline is diana that, that, that why should we as a species of animal need to be told what to eat it should just be so intuitive to us yet they destroyed it with this eating guidelines and, and protein you know the demonization of, of animal source protein and then surrounded us with with uh, hyperpalatable foods, what a, what a great way to kind of destroy um, human health. Uh, if, uh, if you step back and take a big picture view of it, and that's fundamentally what happened. And this is why I'm so passionate about kind of educating people on it. You can't stop it, you can't stop the corporations, but if you can educate people enough, potentially they'll be able to see that. But, you know, just in clinical practice, having done this for years now with a team of dietitians, great team of dietitians, um, that work with us, uh, a very small minority will actually embrace what you're telling them and, and, and go on to adhere to it long term. So which leads me back to the original point that we made that we are, as a species, we, we are sort of driven towards addictive behaviours and some people will, will take on ill health in the pursuit of that and um, that that to me has been very frustrating to watch as a doctor i've found so i deal with two in my clinical practice i have two main areas of of interest and two very different types of people that come to me one are you know metabolically broken overweight want to lose weight and the second are GI cases. I have a wonderful GI doctor that sends me his, you know, troubled cases and I can magically cure them all with just, you know, basically putting them on a very similar diet of just largely, you know, meat and maybe cooked vegetables, you know, just depending on how severe it is. Um, and it's really rewarding for me to work with sick people because they are much more motivated to change. Like there is, you know, as somebody with celiac, I'm not going to go off the rails and eat a bagel on vacation, you know, like there's yeah. just no way. Right. Um, yeah. But I think it's a lot harder when, you know, high blood sugar kind of feels good. And so yeah. it's, you know, and you're, you're just so tempted. It's just so much easier for me to be allergic to the middle of the grocery store. And just to have that completely, you know, I find that um, 
it's, it's, it's sort of like a blessing that I can't eat the majority of the foods that are making so many people metabolically broken. Um, yeah, high, high, high blood sugar is a is a is a high. Um, but if yeah. you if you've if you've sort of done a low carbohydrate diet or, or stuck stayed clear of of um, refined sugar for two months, if you then you feel terrible. To, then you feel terrible. Yeah. So um, and you know, and I think um, this is what we try and get people to see to to understand what health looks like. Um, and the earlier you could start them, the, the, the better they do. Whereas when you're older, the patterns are set generally, like they're stuck in routines and to embrace new concepts, I've found it challenging with uh, older people. Whereas with the younger ones who genuinely want to improve their health, it, it can be a lot more dynamic. Well, I think that there's hope with, um, with older people, uh, I guess. I don't know what you're, you're thinking of elder, I guess I'm, I'm thinking like 40 plus, and I would put myself in that category, but one is, um, you know, the access to these continuous glucose monitors, at least in the U S there's a couple of companies now that you can actually, I've got one on now you can get them without, um, having the diagnosis of being diabetic. And so you, you know, to show people a window into their bloodstream so that they can see, when um, the glucose is, is too high, I think is a really empowering tool for people. And also for people to understand that metabolic conditions and GI conditions can be reversible or can, you know, go into remission. Um, you know, when we're talking about things like Crohn's disease, uh, not all the time, but, but certainly um, it's possible if, if you give it a good shot. Absolutely. I won't sit here and lie and say inflammatory bowel disease will reverse itself with, right. with changes in diet, but we've seen huge amounts of people that do. Uh, not everyone will uh, because immune system-based diseases are complex, complex things. And, um, you know, I don't think any doctor or scientist quite fully grasps what they are uh, as yet, but we've seen huge amounts of people go into remission with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Some, sometimes it's a dual approach. You require medications and diet to get these brilliant outcomes, which we, which we certainly aim for. Uh, but I, I will say that things like irritable bowel syndrome, bloating, flatulence, reflux, these things very rapidly, largely speaking, will settle down on a food that basically eliminates a lot of the, um, the refined carbohydrates. It really does. And uh, once you start emphasizing protein, uh, the, the system really settles. So as a, as a gastroenterologist, I was just kind of very, very... Um, satisfying to see and a lot of people when they come in and tell me that they've got gut symptoms which they think is irritable bowel i try and explain to them that is fundamentally your gut telling you that it's not happy with what's being put in and i actually often describe it as potentially it could be early or evolving metabolic syndrome mm -hmm. which uh which which is a gut your gut's basically telling you that, that that's what's occurring um but you know, people lack that intuition with their own body now. Um, well, I think it's so, because a lot of people are just living, they think it's normal all the time. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, when I finally got my diagnosis at 26 of celiac disease and mm. two weeks on a gluten-free diet, I didn't realize that you could not be in searing pain every day after every meal. I, I think that sometimes a lot of these things are so normalized, you know, even, and, and with aging too, there's this assumption that you must gain tons of weight and, um, have, you know, stiff joints and, and all these, you know, just feel terrible, you know, starting at age 40 or whatever. And it's just not true. And I think one thing that you, um, and then I'll, I'll let you go, but one thing that you brought up towards the, um, in the beginning, and I'm thinking it, towards end of life, but is these dementing illnesses. And I don't think there's enough attention paid on, you know, this idea of type three diabetes with diseases like Alzheimer's and how we can actually try, I mean, not always, but again, there's a good chance that you can make the end of your life a better way to go than um than other people if you just you know take care of yourself and it again is something that 
even if you're 40, 50, 60, changing your diet can have a massive impact on uh, what it's going to look like at the end, basically. Absolutely, Don. I think I think I don't mean to be controversial here, but but I think the way that humans were built or evolved to go out um, as as elderly people was with infection, right? Now that, that's not to say that cancer didn't exist um, in in pre agricultural or early agricultural societies. We know it did, but not to the extent that it does now. Mm-hmm. Right, it's become normalised. Cancer's kind of become normalised as, as part of an end of life um, event, but but it really isn't. It used to be a rare event. The same applies to things like heart disease and strokes and 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 so forth. The way human beings are supposed to go, the large majority of us is with infection, with a declining immune system at, at yeah, that sort of age. Um, so uh, this is the thing, and we've become fearful of, of, of infection and we've done everything to try and uh, prevent it. And that's fine, that's reasonable. You know, there's no question that antibiotics have led to this increase in human lifespan. That's brilliant. That one of the, 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 the most important um, inventions uh, along with uh, some pertinent vaccinations in our history. But um, the modern era assumes that, that metabolic syndrome is the way to go. And I think Alzheimer's and type 2 diabetes and even, even heart disease, you'd have to lump in with that. Um, but I think our perspective has become skewed over time. And when something happens gradually like it has for the last 50, 60 years, um, we've just come to assume it as normal. So, you know, for your children and my children, this will become their norm. I mean, that's what they've been used to, infection, cancer, and autoimmunity. Um, sorry, autoimmunity, cancer, and, and, and metabolic syndrome, and it's resulting complications, and that's sad. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I, I'm sure it's a similar in Australia, but when I was working in the hospital, it was amazing for me to see how many people did not have um, end-of-life plans. And I looked into it a little bit more. Only 30% of Americans have wills. Um, I'm sure it's similar in Australia. So people Mm. don't want to think about that. We've, we've, you know, um, you know, we just push people into nursing homes so that we don't have to look at it. We don't have to think about um, death. And, and as you mentioned, then you've got guilty family that are prolonging someone's suffering instead of, you know, maybe doing what the person would have wanted in the first place. And so um, anyway, that's I, I, not food related, but I think all of this stuff is, is related. And it's, you know, it's really cool to talk to somebody who has a very similar worldview to health because you end up finding out that you align on all kinds of things that, that are just, you know, within this worldview, like once, once you start looking through the lens of evolutionary biology, things fall into place, everything falls into place. Everything falls into place. And, and I think um, evolutionary biology kind of lends an interest to history. So you understand how things work on a political, social, economic scale from the, from the lenses of history. And I think, you, you sort of realize that we just we fall into the same cycle over and over again but but we we now exist in a cycle which has never existed before which is this which is a state of, 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 of corporatism and I think everyone should be warned uh, about that to try and kind of extricate themselves from that to, for the betterment of their health I often tell people like the best thing you can do in terms of your health is to extricate yourself from the healthcare industry and make yourself healthy because there's no doctor um, who's going to to really advocate for your health. They'll advocate for the management of your disease, of course, um, and they'll do that very well. But um, health really lies, it's a personal journey and you've really got to to go through it yourself. Yeah, and be, you know, a, a wildly crazy advocate for yourself. Um, in the face of, you know, pretty much every doctor that you're going to meet, you know? Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, you look at the obesity rates in, 
and um, in, in metabolic syndrome in, in, in our own medical and nursing personnel, uh, they estimate something like 60 to 75% are either obese or overweight in the, in the, in the, in the healthcare industry. And, and you realize that we, if you don't know health, how can you teach it? You can't. So um, we've, we've got a problem there. Yeah. Um, anything else before, before you go? No, listen, I, I, I love your work, um, Dinah, and I think, um, you know, the, the work you've done today is so important and I, I hope, um, it, you know, more people can view it. I think your, your book and documentary should be, should be pertinent viewing for anyone going through the schooling system. Um, however, with the current political rhetoric and narrative that's, that's been put out there by forces much more powerful than yourself, um, um, you know, when I say powerful, they're, they're far more armed financially than yourself. Um, you'll find that 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 narrative won't won't be won't be followed. But um, I really appreciate all the work you've done, and um, you know, I wish you all the best. Well, thank you. I mean, it definitely can feel uh, very lonely doing all of this uh, from you know my little desk over here. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly if you, if your practice was local, I think it'd be so much fun to work with you and your team of dietitians. Um, I'm sure that you have a, a much more satisfying practice than, than most GI practices and much happier, uh, patients. And, um, I just think what you're doing is great too. And let's let people know how to find you. Um, yeah, thanks, Donna. Look, I'm I'm probably most active on on um, Instagram. I find it a good medium. Just it's amazing. I, really- <laughs> I absolutely love your feed so much. It's fantastic. Thank you. Um, just it's under Dr. Pran Yeager Nathan. It's a, it's a very visual medium, and and uh, I tend to use that a lot. And it's the same handle on Facebook as well. I tend to just blog daily on on various things that I'm interested in. And, <laughs> Um, you know, some, some people find it interesting, such as yourself. So I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Well, have a beautiful morning. I'm, I'm uh, heading into dinner here in uh, the Boston area. And uh, thank you so much for your time. It was really great to talk. Pleasure. Thank you, Donna. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening today and for following my work. If you believe in making sure people all over the world should have access to nutritious food, Please join my mission through my nonprofit, the Global Food Justice Alliance. Visit sustainabledish.com backslash join and become a sustaining member today. All sustaining members get early access to ad-free podcasts plus free downloads, and you'll be helping get healthy protein like meat, fish, and eggs to food insecure kids. That's sustainabledish.com backslash join. And thank you.